Good morning to you this morning. Welcome to Forest Heights Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here this morning joining us at 804 Tanger Drive in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Come out anytime you can if you're not here in person and join us. We'd be glad to have you. This morning we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to look at the last verses of the chapter that we've been working our way through 1 Corinthians. And uh, this morning we're down in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 13 and then it ends at verse 24. So we'll be looking at Paul's closing remarks here, or maybe his final thoughts, if you want to put it in that way, as he writes, finishes out this let. I'm reading from the NIV. I believe you'll be able to follow along in whatever version you have. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and be strong. Do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Acacia. They have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and the labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunus, and Acacius arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you, for they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches and the province of Asia send you greetings, Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. So I said, this is Paul's kind of final thoughts. Uh, and uh, as he wraps up the letter, he assigns it. Uh, no doubt someone was dict he was dictating to someone and they, were, they write it all down. And then he signs it to give that uh, credibility, veracity to the letter. And as he closes out, as many times we do, when we close out something, we're always uh, going to try to make sure that everybody got the message. And uh, maybe we summarize or maybe we emphasize certain points. And I think that's what he's done. Now, I don't know if you brought a pencil and paper. If you did, that's fine. If you didn't, that's fine. I've got 15 things here that I think Paul wants us to get out of this. And uh, if you want to write them down, fine. If, uh, if that uh, is of interest to you later, we can get them to you. Uh, but uh, let me give them to you this morning because I think it's important. I think we always give a lot of credibility to people's final words or final thoughts. And Paul is uh, certainly uh, worth listening to. And I think these are things that you can put into action because really that's what we want to do. We want to be able to look at what God's talking about here through Paul. So he writes to this church at Corinth, had a lot of problems. They sent him even letters and people, these three men he mentions here came to him with a letter saying, these are the problems we're having here. We need some, we need some help. And so he grants them this uh, help and uh, and he gives us some uh, some guidance. So I think there's something here that we can put in our own life and our own work as uh, as we go out to do these things. The first thing I see here, and I've titled them kind of it's kind of silly, but I think things to be more things and a few more things. Okay, so don't worry about those. I'll give them to you here, and they all start with be something. So it could be kind of Paul's be attitudes, if you will. But it's a little different than that. Uh, but these are things you can do, I think. So um, looks at me. First thing, thing he says is be on your guard. Verse 13, be on your guard. Uh, be watchful is what I put. Be watchful. We're to watch. What are we watching? We're watching out that we don't allow ourselves to get caught up in the things that, that the world offers, the things that draw us away. There's so many things that draw us away. And that's what we're doing. We're watching. He tells them, watch out. Be guarded against these things, right? Uh, we we want to do that. Uh, that's what they got in trouble in Corinth for was they allowed the world and its ways and things to kind of get tangled up in their lives. They brought some of that with them, like all people do when you come to Christ. You come with some baggage. Uh, we ask God to forgive us, and, and he does uh, through Jesus. And then uh, we're supposed to work on, you know, getting cleaning out or bringing all that stuff and leaving it there with him. Of course, we all know that when you get up, you're usually dragging a few things with you. You know, even when you move, you always take a few things you should have left behind or buried or gave away or something. So he says, be watchful. We want to be watchful. Second thing he says is be steadfast. 
Uh, he calls it be stand, stand firm here in the NIV. Steadfast. Steadfast is an idea that we don't, we're not moved, easily swayed, moved. And he says here that we're to stand firm in the faith. So it's not just being steadfast in anything. Or I have to mention that because, you know, sometimes we can be bullheaded. I can be going steadfast, right? That uh, we can be bullheaded. That's not what he's talking about. We, we need to be steadfast in the faith. We need to be unwavering in our faith and what that means. And understand that we need to get a hold of that so that that we can have a firm place to stand. So many times, so many times, so many people uh, get drawn away, moved, shifted. And we sing a song, you know, on the solid rock, you know, or the anchor holes. You get all that ice in the ground, the shifting. We These are all terms that I that give the idea that we don't need. We have to have a firm lock on what's going on. And Jesus is our savior. And what he wants and what he says is, I am your firm foundation. And foundation in anything else is going to, is going to be faulty and uh, shift around. So we want to be watchful. We want to be steadfast. He says, furthermore, go on, if you will, in that same verse, be courageous. So obviously Paul is not, uh, you know, not ignorant of the fact that being steadfast and watchful requires courage. You have to be willing to stand up to that which is, would move you or would take you out of course or put you out of place. That's difficult sometimes. Sometimes it's, you know, you don't have too many problems. You go along, somebody's pretty amenable and they will go along with it. But then there are times when people are trying to move you out. They want to, they want to push you off your solid rock. They want to unhook your anchor. They want to cut the chain. They, they want to do something like that to you. And you and I, have to be courageous. Courage is one of the things that, that uh, God recognized when he told Joshua, be courageous or be strong, right? We have to be courageous and uh, it's going to be tough. This is not easy. And that's one of the things that people, I think, get a little discouraged by is that when they come to the Lord and he forgives them, they think, okay, I'm on easy street now. Everything's great. But there's, it takes courage to hold on to that, that promise of God, because uh, being a Christian it does not make you or I immune from casualties and tragedies, right? Personal or otherwise. We, we're, we're supposed to be the examples in the face of that. Israel was certainly not, not immune from casualties and tragedies. And they were to be the example of how you deal with those things in light of the realities that they were facing, but with the power and the presence of God. And that's what Christians need to do. Uh, Christians have, can be sad, Christians can be mournful, Christians can be happy, Christians can be broken in their, in their bodies, Christians can be suffering, uh, all, manner, all manners of pain and suffering, but we are to have that, that idea of courage to hold on that none of that means that you have lost your connection to Jesus, because Jesus is holding you. If you're holding Jesus, then yeah, you're going to lose it, right, because you can't hold on. But if he's holding you, then you have that and you need to call it that. We need some simple, I think it's the way I would put it is that most of this stuff, I try to keep it simple because what I find is whenever these life comes at us and one of the things we find in our world today, and, it's, and I'm sure that was true of any time given the context of the time, is the complexity, the complication, the the confusion that comes. And when you're in a confusing, complex situation, what you're going to remember is that which is deeply rooted and simple. Uh, if, you're, if you're in danger, you know, and you, you have maybe, uh, you don't know what to do and you're caught and frozen with fear and anxiety of what to do, there's always something simple. I tell people, if you're facing some danger, first thing to do is put some distance between you and the danger. I mean, I agree. Some of us can move a lot faster than other ones, and I'm not talking to any of us here, okay? And there are some of us that move slower, but moving is the best thing you can do. It's something to do. Moving away from it. Get, put some space between you and whatever the devil's trying to do. Give yourself some time to process. Get, get the, the, these things will come to you if you, uh, if you can look to have one thing you can hold on to. So I think that courageousness there, and he says be strong. Look, if you will, in verse uh, 13, the last one of those there, he mentions is be strong, be strong. The courageousness requires strength. Strength is not a, necessarily a physical only quality. 
Certainly the one he's thinking about, I think here is mental or spiritual strength. The mental strength is only related to only, I think, proportional to how much spiritual strength we have. We need to be strong and, and where we stand. Uh, every one of us has a different understanding of where we are on our, if you will, our path of salvation, where we, where we are in our growth as a Christian. If you're a Christian this morning, we're maturing. Our job is to mature. We don't want to sit around and talk about all the people that are in the 12th grade and, all the, and, and, and we're in the third grade and then we're all depressed and out of our mind. We need to realize that we need to be moving. One of the great tragedies I see and one of the great problems is that, that when people get to some grade level, and I'm going to use that as an example, they get to some grade level and it's ha they're happy there. They like the naps, they like the snacks, they like the you know, instructor, they like whatever, and uh, they've learned how to color inside the lines. And why would I want to go on into more complex and more things? Because that's going to stretch me like the Psalms, right? We're going to stretch ourselves to learn something new. And so we just want to sit there. And there are too many Christians that are chronologically ancient, you know, and I'm going to put myself in a, and I've crossed over a barrier somewhere that cause like everywhere I go, nobody asks me to show them ID about, you know, anything that I'm qualified for, right? The fact is at some point, you know, there, there, there are people, age doesn't matter. It's about what level you're on and are you growing? I tell people who might get discouraged, well, I don't know this or I don't know that. Well, that's fine. What are you learning? Are you growing? Did you know more today, this week, next, this month? Have you, are you growing? We are growing in this, okay? And we are working out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing the Lord is teaching us. And so this is being strong is having that strength of that position that you're in because you are growing. And then the last thing he says in this little section, this uh, I think is in verse 14. Notice he tells us, he said, we need to be watchful, steadfast, courageous, strong, but we do that in love. Because, you know, sometimes when you're courageous, you're, chest gets pumped out here like this and when you're strong your muscles are flexed and then next thing you know the elbows are out and you're just kind of charging through the crowd with sharp elbows and saying well Robbie I'm being courageous and strong you know and I'm steadfast you know but we need to do it in love there needs to be this love this idea of sacrificial love here that that's behind this word we do it he says everything in love Love is not a is not a uh, some sort of emotional thing that causes us to feel all kind of weak. And if it is, you got the wrong idea. Uh, Jesus was uh, in love with the people he came to who deserved none of it, and Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself right for that. That's in love. That willingness that that takes courage. That takes strength of character, strength of of spirit, strength in your position. We must be strong and we do it in love. Always multiple ways of doing things and love is our motivation, is our foundation, if you will, because of the love of God. This is the agape word here, I believe. And so that's, that's perfectly exemplified and, uh, in God, his sacrificial love. So we're not gonna be able to be on our own that sacrificial, but through Christ we can be and we can represent that to others in our, in our desire to be something. That's five things. If you've been counting, there's five. But there's some more good news, all right? Let's move on. Now, he talks about the household of Stephanus. And this, uh, apparently, uh, his household was one of the earliest people in this area that he's speaking of here that were converts uh, to Christianity. And he talks about them. So what's he say about them? There, here's a perfect, here's an example of a person and his household. And what's he say? He said, well, we need to be devoted. Devoted. The idea of giving ourselves attention to that. Holding on to it. What is it that we hold? All of us hold on to something. Right? All of us have some deeply held things. The question really is, what is it? And what are they? And where is the priority? Uh, what are we devoted to? I counsel people occasionally when uh, weddings come along or they're thinking about talking about wanting to get married or, or something like that. I, you've heard me say it before. I'll say it again. I draw a little triangle. It wasn't my invention. I'm just stealing it from somebody else. And I put it on the triangle. Down at the bottom two corners, I put each person. Right? And at the top, I put Jesus. And the closer that they draw to Jesus, the closer they're going to draw together. 
And whenever that, as they approach that pinnacle, he has to be number one. I take it another way. I say, listen, you need to prioritize your life. Everybody has a priority system. I don't care if they think they do or don't. They do because that's how we decide what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, and all that kind of stuff. And so it becomes necessary to prioritize. If Jesus is not going to be at the top of your priority system, it doesn't mean you don't have one. It just means it's not going to work really well. It's not going to be long-term successful, and it's going to have problems. If you're married and you put somebody in, in your family or your spouse ahead of Jesus, that's a problem. Jesus don't like that, and nobody else will either. It will always go apart, fall apart because we not, he has to be the top priority. Amen. He will add to us. He will put us... And this is what happens to people in Christian marriages. If they don't keep Jesus number one, then no matter who, if your spouse is number two, and I believe 100%, I counsel that all the time, that's number two. Family's number three. Everything else gets somewhere down below that. When pastors and preachers get something ahead of, out of order, they suffer and others suffer with it. All right, God in his great mercy was always willing to put us back to the right place, but that happens, and it happens in the Christian ministry. And I think that the, a lot of things happen because of priorities. And so we have to be devoted to the right thing. Being devoted to the wrong thing is not good. Be devoted to God. He says, be devoted. He's devoted himself. Notice what he says in verse 15. Devoted themselves to what? To the service of the Lord's people. And that's our second thing. Be useful. When you're devoted, you know to be useful. And he says, be useful of service. And he tells us to what? To the Lord's people. So Stephanus is noted by Paul as being devoted. And he's not just devoted to anything. He's devoted to the service of the Lord's people. Of course, he helps. His family, his people, they help. They do things to help the work that Paul and the, the Lord has done through Paul in this area. So you want to be devoted, you want to be useful, and the usefulness here in this case that he's talking about is to the Lord's people. In other words, I know that we have a mission to the world, and that's right, and that's true. We also have a mission to the family, and the family is not just our biological family, because the Bible talks about the church as being a family. And we have a mission to the family of the church. And we need to be careful that we keep our things in order. If, the, if you cannot fix something, if you're broken, it's hard for broken people to fix broken people or help be a part of that. We need to get ourselves on solid ground and we need to have, it doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means that we have come to a place where we're trusting God. We're fully fully comfortable with that. We understand what that means and we've come to some level of understanding of that such that we can share. You can't share, in other words, let me put it this way, you can't share what you don't have. You try sharing something you don't have and see how that works. There's too many people that have, have no maturity, they haven't got themselves in the right place and so therefore they're trying to share something they ain't got a grip on. And so his service was useful because he's sharing with the Lord's people, that's the family of God there he says, and he goes on, he says, he says, furthermore, what else? We got to be devoted. We got to be useful. We got to be submissive. That's got to be one of the hardest Western concepts to ever come across the world. I probably, it's, I'm sure it's true of everywhere, but being that I grew up in this environment, being submissive just doesn't go along with the program. You know, we have all kinds of reasons why we can't submit ourselves to something. <clears throat> that something is wrong. It's this, it's that, it's other. Listen, if you submit yourself to the Lord, and you believe the Lord as I do, the believe the Bible says the Lord is King of kings and Lord of lords, and there is no one else. I am the most high. So if there is any other thing, he's the highest one. And he has given us his son and said he is to be looked up to. He is the answer to your situation. You look to him, you're looking to me, you've seen him, you see me. So therefore, you're worshiping the highest thing. What else can be higher? What else are you focused on? We need to be submissive to that. When we're submissive to that, there are going to be people come along all the time. And there are situations that come along all the time. We all work or did work or have work, know what it's about. We all have bosses. You heard that saying, everybody's got a boss. If you got a boss, the Bible tells us how to treat it. Does it say the boss is supposed to be nice? That's the word to the boss. Yes. The people who are, are in charge are to be done a certain way. In other words, you understand we live in a sinful world. 
Sinful people are the people of the world. You got sinful people that have never been saved. You got sinful people who've been saved. And guess what? You don't get to pick and choose necessarily who it is. And your boss is not necessarily following the precepts of the Bible. Well, guess what? That's your boss. There are plenty of people in Paul's day, plenty of people in the first century, plenty of people throughout. The Israelites had their own slaves. They had people as slaves. I'm not saying I'm not advocating slavery. I'm just saying there are people that they were in charge of people. And they were expected to be treat those people correctly. But guess what? The people didn't get to decide that. That was their, their decision. If you're the boss, you've got to be that kind of person. If you're the person who's being bossed, whatever that time frame, then you've got to be willing to understand that above all of this, God is in charge. And this is what you need to be that example. You need to be that person to show them that you can yield yourself to them. That's a really hard thing to do. Being submissive. He said, submit to such people, to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. Here he's talking about, again, the church. And I think that's a great example because within the church, we know many times, and I'm sure that there are people who've been in bigger churches, have more people to deal with, more situations. The people there are not always submissive, right? They're not always going to go along with the program. Well, one is the person who's in charge still has to maintain their biblical perspective, their their commands from God to be that person to do that person right and the people who are not being submitted this is the problem we always have is we want to try to straighten everybody out you know fix them and let me tell you something I, I can tell you this without any equivocation you can't fix people God can fix people but you can't fix them you can pray for them you can lead them you can help them you can guide them but they're going to have to do it they're going to have to do it. We do not believe that you that you or I or any preacher or anybody on earth saves people. God saves people. God convicts people in, the, in that sense. And God brings them. And they have to answer to God. Okay, so be submissive. He said, this is it. He said, such people. He said to such people. And he's using Stephanus as an example of his family. Let these, remember, Corinth was having a problem. Let me not lose track of that so you won't understand the context here. These people at Corinth had, they were a church that Paul started. So they're Christians. And no doubt they're like any church of any time and any place and time. There are always people there that were believers and people that weren't. There are people in the Israel that were faithful to God and people that weren't. The Bible talks about it all the time, even before Jesus. And so guess what? When he talks about the group here, it doesn't mean every single person was exact, was right with God. But it does say this, look, the church there had gotten off track. They were following the wrong people. They were doing all kinds of things. Some of it was way outside. I doubt they were, the, these people were in the Christian community, uh, Christian faith. They were just in the building, or if you want to call it that, or in the come there and hang out, but they were way off. But he says, there are people there that need to submit to. There are some people there that are in charge that are doing what I want them to do. Look for them and follow them. So we're not blindly following just anybody because of their their title or their situation, standing, wherever it is, we're following the people that are following God. That's what he's pointing to here. So my, submitting to them. Number, seven, uh, number next is, I think it's number nine. Number nine is be glad, verse 17. I was glad. Paul says, I'm glad. You know, people think of Paul. Paul, I don't know what Paul looked like. I, nobody knows what Paul looked like. We just get a description of him. In the, he wasn't a big, tall guy. Probably wasn't really handsome looking. Probably was kind of gnarly, you know, and rugged because he he had to walk everywhere he went and he ran into all kinds. He'd been beaten and <laughs> snake bit and all, all kinds of stuff. Paul was, probably Paul had a pretty rough life, right? So, but he says, I'm glad. So people don't usually think of Paul as being glad about things. Sometimes I think you get the impression that Paul is just a grouchy old dude and he's just writing this letter rebuking these people. But I don't, you know, I, I think they misunderstand Paul. He says, I'm glad. He said, I was glad when I seen these three guys. They came. They came. You know what? They came bringing a letter to Paul. Paul, you left. You're in Ephesus. The church got started in Corinth. And man, it's all off the rails. It's going crazy. Paul said, I was glad when I saw him. You know why Paul was glad? Because he was glad because they called out to him for some help. They didn't just keep doing the same old thing over and over again, expecting different results. They went, Paul said, these guys said, we're going to take it on ourselves to go see Paul and see if Paul can help us put this thing back on the right track. 
They were willing to ask for help. He said, I'm glad you came. You guys supplied some stuff. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't bring an offering and they didn't bring something to help Paul out. But you know what? Sometimes it's not about the money or the stuff. It's just about the fact that you can ask, that you can go. Remember, these guys didn't have text messages, email, airplanes, trains, cars. They had to travel in a very primitive fashion to all the way to Paul, get this letter to Paul. Writing a letter was a very expensive proposition to say the least. Materials were, were valuable. It was rare, hard to get a hold of, all that stuff. They went there with Paul and they brought this to him. And he says, you know, I was glad. Now, Paul said, think about it, Paul, Paul you're nuts. Wait a minute, Robert, why are you saying Paul's nuts? He was glad these three guys came bringing this letter of this disaster that was going on in Corinth. Paul goes, this is what I'm here for. Now, I, you know, this is one of the things God wants me to do is help straighten this stuff up. This is what God does. He puts people in places to help out things that he always knows. And so, yes, it was a disaster in Corinth. And yes, these guys traveled a long way. And yes, Paul was glad they came so he could help them out. Aren't you glad when, as a parent, when your child asks you for a little help? Don't you feel like you're useful again? You know, when they get grown, when they're little, they got to have all kind of help. And you get to go, man, I wish they'd get grown so I could stuff bother me, right? But when, you're, when they get grown, then you got look, looking around like, well, what am I here for? And when I'm called, you have, hey, dad, hey, mom. Uh, and you just, you can just feel, I don't know. I, 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 you just like, whoa, okay. Yeah, this is great. What can I do? You know. And there hell, he's glad. He was glad, so be glad. And then be refreshing. Notice what verse 18, he said, for they refreshed. So these guys came with a, with a letter full of problems. Paul was glad to see him because they gave him an opportunity to help him. And he was glad for that. He was glad that they came and report some stuff about Corinth because he probably didn't hear a lot about it until somebody told him. And then he says, for they refresh my spirit and yours. What does he mean? Well, they refreshed Paul because they, as I said before, they gave him purpose, they gave him meaning, they gave him a chance. And he said, it refreshed yours. Why is that? He said, because they allowed me, they had confidence in me to help you out. So he, we're going to help you. God will help you through me if you will listen to him. He says, so they're refreshing your guys. This is the people back at Corinth when he sends us answers back, right? He says, you're going to get help. These guys deserve recognition. So you want to be refreshing. We want to be refreshing people. We want to have, think about this. Now, I know I have to think about this a lot because I have, you know, some weak areas, that, some things that are lacking in my understanding of things. And so I have to get some help. And so God has given me a helper to, to help me a lot. So I have to ask her questions. Is this the right way to do this? Should I, because you know, I'm all about, you know, think of me like an Excel spreadsheet or something. You know, it's two plus two equals four. Put this box in here and it's always that no matter what. Right. So I need a little help on about how to present that. Right. How to put it, how to put the food on the table, not just eat it or go. Yeah, it's food. Let's eat it. Right. So that's what he said. He said, these guys need to search, deserve some recognition and we are to be refreshers. What we need to do is when we're going to do this help. So remember, we're going to put this in our life. We have some stuff to do. We have to be something. It's not just do it. You notice I didn't say do this and do that. We need to be these things. So what we got, that's a little deeper. That's a little harder to do. So we had to realize this when we're offering, and this is the thing what I'm talking about. When I have to offer up some sort of counsel or, you know, we call it advice or something we're trying to interject into a conversation and maybe be helpful. We have the idea, let's, let's go for, let's stipulate motivation is helpfulness, but we also got to be, realize that we need to be a refresh. We need to refresh the people with this. You know, you can take a glass of water to somebody and throw it in their face and you gave them water, <laughs> right? Uh, but we want to refresh them. So we want to feed it to them slowly, right? Or we want to give it to them so they can get the benefit of it. So we want to do that. That's where I'm talking about myself. Now, you all are much better at that than I am, but that's why I have you all around me is to help me with that. But the point is we need to be that. We need to be all of this stuff that we're being has this motivation of love and it, it requires some, some thinking and some effort on our part always, right? 
and we need to realize that we, what it, it's all driven and we need to be refreshers. So when we get out of a conversation, let's say, let's, do, let's see this, see if we can talk about it like this. When you're engaged in something, check yourself. You know, we call this in the military and other places debrief. What does that mean? Well, after the thing happened, we sit down with people and we talk about what happened. So what do we, what's the benefit? One, we can learn what worked and what didn't work. We can understand the situation after it's over. We take the advantage of 2020 hindsight. So guess what? Maybe you don't have anybody to debrief with, maybe, but you certainly have yourself and the Lord, you can debrief with the God. That would be really good. How about the person that knows everything and has all the right answers? Sit down and think about how did you, how did I, how did I think that went? Lots of times, if you're genuinely motivated with the right way, you will understand where you think you could have done a little better or you, that, and you will change. You will be that. Was I, did I think I was refreshing? Did I have the right attitude? Where was I weak? Where was, this is absolutely essential. That's when we gather for Bible study so we can study. Everybody brings something. We all sit down and look at it. We read this thing. We studied it. Now, what, what's, what's God talking about? And we take those pieces of this and that and the other. We put them together. And God speaks through the group, right? Through all of us. And so this is a refresh. So we get the message. And then a few more things, right? Let's look at verse 20. Uh, now, <clears throat> verse 20, he says, All brothers and sisters, here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. So what does that mean? I, I looked about that and I wanted to, I thought, well, you know, Rob, we can go on to talk about all the holy kiss and, you know, the whole rigmarole there. And we can study the history of it and such and such as that. It was a kiss, okay? It was just, it was a kiss. It was a way of greeting. Now, what I put here is be vulnerable. Why not put be vulnerable? Well, it's not our culture in America to do a lot of kissing, especially on people that we ain't married to or our children, right? And even among them, we're not a lot of kissing on guys by guys, right? So, so think about it this way. For these people, Paul is talking to them, the holy kiss, what was the idea? The idea was, think about this. You got in somebody's personal space. To give them, even the, you see them in, on TV, the, some of the uh, other cultures, they will do the key on each cheek kind of thing, right? That, you got, there's, that's, dude, you can't put your hand between them. <laughs> that's close, okay? That's, that means vulnerable. When you get that close to somebody, you're terribly vulnerable. And that's, that's a whole thing here. I think what he's saying is, remember, this is a church of Corinth that's having a lot of problems and they're dividing up into little cliques and groups and arguing about stuff. So they definitely needed to move closer. I'm sure they weren't a whole lot of holy kissing going on in Corinth. Okay? So you think about it that way. They needed to get more vulnerable. You need to be willing to be vulnerable in a, in a sense that we need to get close. We need to be willing to put aside our own defense mechanisms to make ourselves fun. Well, Robbie, wait a minute. Hold it on a second. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm talking about a verbal standoff or a, or a sort of a, which is, turns out to be physical in some ways, but, but this distance we have in our head. Well, guess what? Well, what if, I, what if I make myself vulnerable and they attack? Okay, guess what? Who owns you? Who is dwelling in you? Who are you a temple of? Who is it really in charge of this whole thing? Who knows before you attack the other thing that's coming? Who knows all the outcomes that this is going to do? Who knows all that? Oh, yeah, that guy, the most high. He knows. He knows. So if you're a vulnerable, it's because he wants you to be. He wants you to show that your vulnerability is not of weakness, but of strength in the fact that there is nothing anyone on this earth can do to you mentally or spiritually or anything else that upsets your apple cart and he's going to work through that he's going to he's going to allow us to get close because sometimes we can't solve a problem until you get close to the problem to get the root of it and all of us are good at dancing everybody is good people who are terrible out in the parking lot come in how are you i'm fine everything's great everything's wonderful Great, wonderful. You have no, I'm great. Imagine everybody went to the hospital over here. There. Went to the hospital, walked in the door, they said, it's wrong, nothing. What are you doing here? Wow, well, nothing, nothing. I don't feel too good. Well, I thought you said nothing. Well, nothing's really wrong with me. Okay, we'll see you later. 
You know, that you have to own. You know how hard it is? Doctors, they've gotten a lot better at this than they used to be. They ask a lot of questions. Because they're trying to find out what's wrong with you because nobody wants to tell them. We can't stand vulnerability. We hate weakness. We hate... It's a... I don't know if it's a man thing or a, definitely a Western thing. Can't be vulnerable. So this is... You know where that... You know the handshake. I don't want to spend too much time on it. You know what the handshake was, right? Why we shake right hands? Right hand shake. Because in the days when they carried knives <laughs> and where most people are right-handed, you stuck out the hand that would have the knife in it so that you could show, I don't have no knife and you don't have no knife, so let's know we can talk, we can get this close, right? That's the, so it was about vulnerability. Second thing here on this list, uh, on this last part here, I think it's number 12, be forewarned. There's only one kind of negative thing in this whole list here, I think, and that's verse 22. Where Paul says, uh, let the person be cursed. In other words, anyone who does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. This is a forewarning. This curse goes back to the, uh, I think, one of the terribly confused things. And I won't belabor that. But back in the day when God gave Israel their job, I think people have lost track of the idea that he told them, you do this and it's going to be good. You do this, it's going to be bad. He was telling to the 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 supposedly, you know, I say that, don't mean that I don't agree with it, the chosen people. So they had a choice to make then. They were not guaranteed, a, you know, the, oh, here, come on into heaven. You're going to be great. You're always going to get in no matter what. No, do this and it works good. Do this and it's going to go bad for you. So he said here in verse 22, and this is a different word for love. This is the filial word. This is the brotherly love. That kind of, Anyone who doesn't show an affection toward the Lord, anybody who's not friendly to God, this doesn't necessarily mean they're Christian or not. It just means that they have an overt aversion, a, a terribly... We live in a world where we don't need examples of that, right? People are just absolutely 100% against God. These people are cursed. They're cursed. He said they're cursed already. Well, we know that they're caught up in sin. They're cursed already. He said they're cursed. So be forewarned that there is another side to this. God is not some mealy, weakly guy who's just going to have to take everybody because he loves everybody. So therefore, he's just going to have a bunch of losers and people who reject him. That'd be the, the, time, the definition of loser to me. Reject him into heaven because, well, there are people and I just go. And I'm in. So he says, be forewarned, the people who don't have an affection to God. You know, there are people that wear suits, give money, sit in pews and chairs, and read Bibles. They have no affection for God. No real care about God. They're just trying to, you know, make some business connections or some social connections or something else. They're, they're just trying to look like it to everybody else. God knows that. We don't have to sort that out. That's what God knows. But he says they're going to be cursed. So be forewarned. And number next is, and this list is be ready. Same verse, verse 22 he says, there are the last two words there come Lord. Now, you know, I make a lot of big deal about this, but the Greek words there, according to my uh, research, is Maranatha. We hear it that way. You've heard that. So there's a song with the Maranatha. Everybody's like, it sounds really good because it makes good music, but they don't really know what it's talking about. <laughs> Just means come Lord. And that's actually a, a kind of a, a knockoff of the Aramaic term, which I have no idea what it was. But the, uh, the Aramaic term was Lord come. And... So the, the people in the Bible brought that in. It came in. You find it in, in uh, Revelation. The idea is, you know, be ready. God's coming. He's coming. And be ready. That's what I think it is. Come it means you're ready. You don't want anybody to come over to your house. Don't call the cab if you ain't ready. Right? If you ain't ready, don't open it. I'm sorry, I'm not ready. Oh, I can tell you don't have any clothes on. Let me just wait a minute and I'll talk to you later, right? In other words, we don't come to ask for something we're not ready for, so be ready, right? So we need to be forewarned. We need to be ready. Paul wraps it up with a couple others. Let me quickly say those. Numbers, verse 23, he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Be gracious. He's asking for the grace of God to be with his people, and that's good because we all need grace but guess what? God asks his people to be gracious because we're supposed to be like him. <laughs> gracious. Be gracious. Grace is, an un, is a kind of a mercy that's not merited, not done. We're giving something. It's the gift. It's, gracious is like a gift. We're get, 
gift. We're gifting them something. We're doing something for them. Right? That's the grace of God. The grace of God poured out on a sinful, evil world wasn't because we done anything good. That's what the Bible says. We all sin. All fell short. But the grace of God. So be gracious. And then the last one. Verse 24. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Be sacrificial. This is again the word here for love is agape. You know that from your various studies, I'm sure. Agape is that sacrificial love. And the agape is a word, and it was used in their language. However, we have come to understand the biblical example of agape is, is, is perfectly seen in Christ, in God's efforts to love us while we were still sinners. So it's sacrificial. God sacrifices right justice and all that to love us Right, so this is sacrificial. We, must, we need to be sacrificial. There are unlovely people in the world. I agree with that. But we have not been given that uh, as a mandate. We're given the opportunity to love. We are sacrificing our own particularities and peculiarities, our own preferences. In the case of, of trying to come to get people to know Jesus, we need to be careful that we are not holding too many things in front of them. The else, less world, just like the Pharisees. We created these multi layer barriers. They never start with just, they don't drop 600 on you all at once. It's one and then another and then another and then another. We ought to be careful about that. Sacrificial. Sacrificial means putting aside my own personal beliefs or not beliefs in Jesus, but my own personal preferences and things. I don't, you know, I don't like this or I don't like that. I don't do, we're sacrificing. Why? Because we want somebody. To come to see Jesus as, as the sacrifice that he was. He put aside his, his divinity in the sense of his heavenly domain and all that that went to live in a human decaying body, right? He lived in a body that was vulnerable, a body that needed rest, needed food, needed sleep, needed all these things. He put himself in that. He put himself in the midst of a bunch of nasty people, right? Wouldn't matter what century he was in or where he was grown up. It would have been the same thing. They're all nasty because they're sinners. And he put himself in there and he put up with their their ignorance and their faithlessness and their confusion and their distractions and all that. And he reached out to them anyway, right? Some of them got it. Some of them didn't. The Bible seems to show that. He reached out to both kinds. And so that's sacrificial. Probably could be more things here, but I 15 is about all you can handle. So let's just leave it at that. At the end of this letter, Paul writes these things. He wants us to be some stuff. So if you've been struggling with something to do, you know, we get a variety of things to do. Or if you would like to be as one of these modern things that I hear about all the time, influencers. Influencer has to be something. Here you are, 15. I think there's something there you can, we can all get a hold of. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we could gather here. We thank you, Lord, for this work of Paul that you poured into Paul's life and Paul in an effort to follow you as closely and completely as he could he pours it out into the lives of this church at Corinth and these men that came and and then by extension Lord you through your infinite wisdom have brought it to us brought it to us in a language you can understand and form that we can get a hold of thank you this morning Lord I pray that we can be these things and that we can work on the ones that we are weak in. And knowing that you full well will help us and guide us. I pray this morning, Lord, that someone finds themselves totally outside your family this morning. Desires to come to know you as Lord and Savior, they would. They come this morning confessing their vulnerability, their sin, their repenting of all that, that uh, of their ignorance and their deliberateness. Asking you, Lord, to forgive them and grant them access to your family. Grant them the grace and mercy that you promised. I pray that they'd have to do that this morning. There's Christians, Lord, that are struggling. Stuck in third grade, stuck in fourth grade, stuck somewhere. Maybe they've got a PhD and, and they think they've reached the end of it, Lord. I pray there are always things we can get. I pray this morning, Lord, for each one of us that's struggling in some way, some way to get a hold of this that you will graciously and kindly reach out to us and help us to be better 
disciples, better witnesses, better ambassadors. And we ask of these things this morning in Jesus' name.